Hey, I heard you like XML. Why don't you come over, sit by the fi- What? They're not dating you. No, 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 they're dating- They're dating the table. The... What? Oh, this is awkward. Hi everyone, I'm Doug Lane with Brent Ozar Unlimited. And welcome to today's webcast of why you simply must have a date table. If you've written a lot of code around T-SQL that involves dates, then you kind of know what I'm getting at when I say it's really redundant to keep asking for the date name, the month name, and so on. Well, it turns out there's a tool that can make your life a whole lot easier and have you writing code faster. All you have to do is plop a single table into a database, be it a utility database or wherever. And that is a date table. I'll give you four compelling reasons why you really ought to have a date table. Number one, you can do lookups by name or by date. Number two, you can do fiscal periods. So if you're on a fiscal calendar, you can look this stuff up rather than having to write a whole bunch of case statements to address when the fiscal year begins and ends. Number three, you can fill in date slices. So if you need to do sort of a cross join on a day, you can have days one through 31, whether there's data tied to them or not. And finally, you can return the names of entire periods without having to do a whole bunch of nasty casting and concatenation. We'll get into these four in a minute, but first let's take a look at what a date table looks like in practice. So here we've got a create script for the dim date table. Um, now right off the bat, you might be wondering, why is it dim date and not just date? Well, a couple of things. One, date is a reserved SQL Server keyword, and when we're setting up a date table, we want to make sure that we don't step on anything that SQL Server already has reserved. So um, you'll notice here that also month long name is used because month name is another reserved keyword. So we've got to drop and create. And then the way we're going to go about scripting this table is we'll just declare a bunch of variables, fill them in as we go, loop through one by one, which sounds inefficient, but for a table this size, for 10 years, you're talking 3,600 rows or so. So it really doesn't take that long. And what we'll do is we'll set up our script to run so that the first day is actually January 1st, 2010. In order to do that, we'll have to back this up a day. No big deal and then we'll run the loop until we get to the end of the year 2019. So basically we want 10 full calendar years in there. And for the columns, you can see we're doing a bunch of date part, date name, all the kind of uh, redundant lookup syntax stuff that you'd have to remember otherwise. We're gonna take care of all that here in the table. And then also what we wanna do is add a date key that's an integer field. The reason for this is that if you do joins to an int, you're going to get a more efficient join and more efficient query operations than you would using a date field. Now you might be saying, well, the date data type is four bytes and the int data type is four bytes. What's the difference? Well, you'll see that coming up. Another reason why you'd want to use an int field is that data warehouses typically use an int field as a date key. Uh, you'll see this in AdventureWorks if you download that sample, but it's a much more efficient way of using a date as a key in a data warehouse is to use that as an int. And we'll see the difference coming up in an execution plan here. And then I'll also add some fiscal year data. And again, if you look at the kind of code that's going on here, you'll see stuff that you might otherwise have to write over and over whenever you write a query that wants to return the fiscal quarter and the fiscal year. This is stuff that you're much better off just looking it up based on today's date or whatever date you're attaching it to. And then I added a few other things in here as well. We've got a calendar quarter full name, a calendar month name, and then a fiscal quarter name and fiscal year full name as well. And one last little thing that I threw in was a day of the week abbreviation. So let's say that the company wants to see all of the days of the week 
listed with three characters when it's abbreviated, except for Thursday because THU looks kind of weird. And instead they want to see THURS. So we'll just put it in a little bit of logic here. And again, this is stuff that you are putting in the table so you don't have to do it later. And with that all set, we'll fill up the table. And so I'll run it down to that point. And you'll see, in spite of the fact that I'm doing a while loop, this happens very quickly. So there we were, two seconds. And let's hide the results and see what we've got. Okay, there's our date table. You can see down here, 3,600 rows or so. That's pretty much what we expect with the two leap years in there. And looks like everything filled up just the way we expected it to. And again, here are some of these lookup names that we'll talk about a little bit later. But for the time being, just note that it's a very lightweight table. In fact, if we wanted to check out how much space this takes up, take a guess. Less than, a, well, about a third of a megabyte. So very, very little space. I'm not indexing it yet, but it's surprisingly tiny for what we've got in it so far. So we'll close that. And I'll go ahead and add a couple of indexes on it. So I'll do the clustered index by the date key, because again, that's an int field. And I'll do a non-clustered index on the full date followed by the date key. So I'll go ahead and add those. Again, tiny table, happens fast. So that's what our dim date table looks like. Now, here's a question that we kind of tabled for a moment. We'll come back to now. Why would we want to use an int field if those two fields are the same size? What's the difference? Well, let me switch this around real quick and you'll see what the difference is. Now this users table is not especially large. It's got about 40,000 rows in it. And what I'm going to do is grab the execution plan for each of these statements. And I'll run them side by side so we can see, relatively speaking, they're about the same. The one that uses the date field to join on is 49%. The one that uses the int field is 51%. So that's the case with a small table. You may not get great return on investment if you're going to do a join to an int there. But what happens if you're connecting to a fact table, something that typically in a data warehousing scenario anyway, has millions of rows or even hundreds of millions. So let's do that same thing. Now these field names are interchangeable. So I'm going to just change the table name and I'll get the plan and look at that. I'll scroll down here so you can see the difference between the two queries. This first one I'm joined to the creation date of the comment as a date. Um, I actually had to create a persistent calculated column because the date in this Stack Overflow model is a full date. So it's got the date and time and joining to that doesn't really work out. Not when you're joining to a straight up date type. With the date key, I also have to set up a creation date as int column. That way I have dates that are compatible for me to join to my dim date table. If I have a date and a time in there, that's going to be a problem. So if you look at the relative cost of the two, we've got 71% up here, and that's when I'm connecting to the comments table using a date, and only 29% down here where I'm connecting to it as an int. And it's been my experience, not just with this example, but with other data warehouses as well, that the bigger the table you're talking about, the more efficient that int join becomes versus a date join. So here are some examples of lookups that we can do with our dim date table that will save us a lot of work down the road. This first query that I've got here, I just want to get the day of the week and then a count of the number of comments based on the day that we, they were created. So I want to see all the comments that are made on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so forth. So what I'm going to do is select from the comments table here, 
joined a dim date, I'm going to join on the full date and the creation date as a date. Now remember Stack Overflow uses a date and time as their creation date columns. So I have to use a calculated column based on the date or I just trim it down to a date type. So I'm gonna run this and it'll take about six, seven seconds and I'll get back the number of comments and the day of the week. And again, this is the kind of thing that I can easily look up and not have to deal with doing the date part, remembering what's the syntax for day of the week? Is it DD, is it W, is it DW, what is it? All that stuff's taken care of for me. And if I wanna do that again down here, this time using the date abbreviation of the week, I'll run that, and it'll save me the trouble of having to write the case when it's Thursday, make it five, otherwise three, that'll come back and I'll get my abbreviations there too. And again, all this stuff is centralized. So not only am I getting this information quickly, but everybody else that would be writing this code is referencing that same dim date table. So there's homogeny amongst all of the results that we get back, depending on what field we're asking for. Now recall that when we set up our dim date table, we set it up to use a date key as an int field. And that was going to be the field where we set up our clustered index and where we did joins wherever we could. And the idea being the join would be more efficient, the query would run faster, and so forth. We kind of saw that with the execution plan, but that was an estimated execution plan. It wasn't actually getting results back. Now we have something that we can test against. So let's see what happens. We ran this last time with the dates as the join field, and we got results back in about seven seconds. Let's see what happens when we use the date key instead and join on int fields. Quite a bit faster, wasn't it? It was down to about two seconds. So you can see the larger the table, the more dramatic the performance gains will be just in the difference between an int and a date. So keep that in mind. It's not something where you necessarily want to go through and completely redesign everything that has a date field in it, but it's something where if you have a data warehouse, for example, and there's an int field there and you can join to it, it's definitely worth doing. Fiscal calendar information is great for storing in a dim date table because if you think about the amount of code that you have to write just to get two simple numbers back, in this case, let's say the fiscal quarter and the fiscal year, look at all the code that we have to pile up just to get that sort of information. We've got two case statements here, one that'll say which quarter it is and then one that says what the year is. Now this particular code sample assumes a July to June fiscal year, but if you move the numbers around, you can make it work for any particular fiscal year setup. If you look at how much code is here though, why would you ever want to write that more than once? There's a, a lot to do here and it's a lot that can possibly get messed up the more you write it. You're much better off storing this kind of information in a dim date table. Another scenario, what happens if your business moves its fiscal year? Think of all the logic that would have to be rewritten. Think of all the times that you'd have to hunt down code just like these case statements, whether it's in the app side or in the database, and rework all that to fit the new fiscal year model. Or same with calendar year. Suppose that they decide to go from a fiscal year to a calendar year. Now, as unlikely as that seems, it's still really handy to have this in a dim date table just in case that happens. Another cool thing that you can do with a dim date table is have date slices. So let's say for example, I have a business that runs seven days a week, but hardly anything happens on Saturday and Sunday. So occasionally I will have days where there are no records recorded for those days. And I wanna see across the entire month what happened on each day. Now the trouble is, if I just ask for that directly from the table and then ask for, you know, date name, date part, whatever of the day that things happen, 
when I get those results back, I will have gaps in my data. I'll have days where nothing happened, so it will look like that day never existed in the first place. And here's an example of that. Let's say that I want to set up this common table expression, and I just want to see a count of new users, and I'm sort of artificially introducing a gap here to prove the point. And I want to see where the day of the week is not Sunday or Tuesday. So let's say we're just creating these holes in our data where Sunday and Tuesday have nothing. So you see, instead of starting on the 1st of January, I'm starting on the 2nd, and then there's a gap on the 3rd, there's a gap from the 9th to the 11th, uh, there's a gap from the 7th to 9th, and so on. When I select from this, I don't see the 1st, the 3rd, because according to the data, those days never happen. Now, I'm going to comment this out and show a different way, except this time I'm going to join to the data from the dim date table. And when I do that, there we have it. I've got my gaps filled in. And I can see I get some actual visual confirmation here that, yes, January 1st exists according to our calendar. January 3rd does, the 8th, the 10th, and so on and so forth. But nothing happened on those days. It's the kind of thing where if you don't have those gaps filled in, you know, maybe your reporting tool might do that for you, or if you throw this data in Excel and chart it, it might take care of that. But if you're just pasting raw data somewhere or you're returning results back, you know, in an app of some kind, it might not be smart enough to fill in those date gaps. And the problem is that can create suspicions amongst your users. They'll say, I don't trust this data because I don't see January 1st. I don't see January 3rd. It's not there. So something must be wrong. The dim date table is a great way of making sure that all this stuff is filled in so you can kind of alleviate any suspicions about the data being inaccurate. Let's say your business has some trouble with inconsistencies about date formats and it's starting to kind of drive everybody nuts. So we've got a developer over here that's doing dates a certain way, a user over there that's got another idea about how dates should be formatted, and people are starting to get a little restless about this problem. This is your chance to step up and be a problem solver and say, look, this is a small table, it's perfectly manageable, I'll set it up, that way everyone can agree on the contents, and from there, everyone can refer to it, and we won't have trouble anymore about people remembering the right cast or concatenation, syntax or sequence, whatever. All this stuff will flow from one place and everything will start to look like it's coming from the same company. Wouldn't that be great? And it's so easy to do, it's so lightweight. It's not gonna cause a lot of trouble. So let's take some fields, like we've got the calendar quarter full name, calendar month full name, fiscal quarter, fiscal year, kind of the same idea. This is all code that no one will have to rewrite once you've got it stored in the dim date table. And let's take a look at the contents and you can see kind of what I'm talking about. I'll scroll over here to some of the more customized stuff that we put in there. And we only put in like four columns here. So there's plenty of space for all the other ways that you'd want to represent a date in whatever output you put out. So we've got a calendar quarter full name, 2010Q1, calendar month full name, January 2010, fiscal quarter, fiscal year. This is all stuff that if we didn't have a date table, we'd have to be writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And if you start multiplying that by the number of people that have to do that rewriting, you can look really good by saving all those people all that amount of time. So there you have it, folks. Four compelling reasons why you should have a date table in your database and how you can use it to save yourself a lot of time when it comes to writing T-SQL code. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.